question that goes to your mind when you think of Gnosticism is when did it begin and what was the source of it? Where did this idea come from? It seems that uh, when a collection of texts was found in Egypt in 1945, the original Gnostic texts, people were very excited about the prospect of finding out the truth about Gnosticism. And the reason why they were so positive about this is because Gnosticism was only really known from Christian writers such as um, Irenaeus who were trying to discredit it. The, the Church Fathers traced the Gnostic heresies back to Simon Magus, which we see in the book of Acts chapter 8. Now, the documents that they discovered in Egypt unfortunately do not reflect an age greater than that of the Gospels, and it does seem to be logical to assume there was a lot of Gnostic thinking, perhaps in religions you can see, perhaps in Zoroastrianism, and Mithraism, maybe even Buddhism. All of these contain elements of Gnosticism, but it also is logical to assume that in most religions you can find parallels in certain areas. So it's, it seems rather to be logical to say that Gnosticism actually was a reaction to Christianity and it seemed to develop alongside Christianity. It seems to be a combination of, of the philosophical thinking of the Greeks. Um, there's pagan concepts in it as well. There's a bit of Judaism as well as Christianity. Um, much Gnostic thinking can be explained as a meditation out of the book of Genesis, for example, and the book of Proverbs, where you see uh, wisdom is personified as a woman. Um, so the idea is that many scholars feel that Gnosticism was in fact the original Christianity, and it actually developed before Christianity, and there was this controlling faction that arose later, and we'll discuss more of this as we go along. pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. In our own time, there are many thinkers and writers who may not even be aware that they have Gnostic themes running through their work. For example, the science fiction writer Philip K. Dick, as well as Albert Camus, George Orwell, Aldous Huxley, among many others. Gnostic ideas are affected in the 20th century by the ideas of existentialism, in which we have a material world, but it has no creator and it's a result of a cosmic accident called evolution. But it is no less absurd and alien in the minds, and this is a Gnostic thought. It may seem somewhat simplistic in a diverse and complex society, but it is clear that there is a universal thread in the ideas of Gnosticism, which is tied up with the inspirations and longings of mankind. That's not to say Gnosticism, distilled into a religious orthodoxy with adherents, is the one true faith, but rather the struggles of man about the strangeness of his existence, his feelings of alienation, the feeling of being trapped and limited by your physical restraints, um, an environment that is full of suffering and pain and irony. 
There is this longing for something higher and better, the desire to attain a deeper level of wisdom and understanding. The rejection of a material world and all it has to offer, which is accompanied by a deep distrust of all things physically pleasurable. They are superficial and uh, they are on the surface. They hide a deeper reality that can only be achieved by the denial of the surface pleasures of this material world. Uh, if we speak about this Gnosticism as a reaction to Christianity, what then was the big issue with Christianity? Um, the issue they had was seen in their interpretation of the Torah. They concluded that the creator of earth, Yahweh, was cruel and malevolent. There is another superior deity who is transcendent and unknowable. Mankind has retained a spark of that transcendent wisdom and knowledge and the meaning of the creation drama when properly understood is that human beings, Gnostics in particular, derive their knowledge and life from this transcendent God. But through the mean-spirited actions of the Demiurge, the creator of the world, they have been confined within this world. Humans in this world are imprisoned, asleep, drunken, fallen, ignorant. They need to find themselves to be freed, awakened, sober, raised, enlightened. In other words, they need to return to Gnosis. There's a strong element of disgust for everything material. Pleasure of any kind is regarded as part of the trickery of the Demiurge to keep mankind enslaved. It became embedded in the Gnostic movement that the rejection of all physical comfort and pleasure was part of the process of moving towards the light and revelation of the purity of spiritual knowledge. Spiritual Spirituality and truth and purity is as far removed from material realm as is possibly able to achieve. We need to get away from this material realm in order to get anywhere near um, wisdom and purity. So it is the Gnostic teaching that is behind the movement we know as asceticism. This is to do with the role of the Gnostic Savior, which is who he awakens people under the spell of the Demiurge, living in material, or you could say sin. Um, this is not the Christ who pays for sin through his death on the cross, but rather Christ is a prophet who guides people through his example and through teaching and uh, the move towards enlightenment. It is this part of enlightenment in which the Gnostics try to emulate the example of Christ through poverty, through meditation, self-denial and study. It's much overlooked fact that the ascetic lifestyle that the adepts sought in order to achieve spiritual enlightenment was a direct reference to the Gnostic view of a degenerate and fallen world. By refusing to partake in anything that pleases the flesh, the Gnostic believed they were able to break free from bondage and slavery that is part of the enslavement of the Demiurge. Okay, but we repeat ourselves. What's more interesting fact to explore is how the Gnostic teaching appealed to the idea of man uh, through the use of his own willpower and self-discipline. Uh, this idea of deprivation and denial can lead to spirituality. Uh, it's in the third century that these ideas begin to become entrenched in the minds and beliefs of mainstream Christianity. Not only that there is plenty of evidence that Gnostic teachings were dovetailed to the Catholic as well as the Orthodox churches and very much in evidence to this day, there is much said about the suppression of the Gnostics by this mainstream Christianity. Constantine became emperor and he was cruel and violent as any emperor before him and he was responsible for creating a church that he could use as a political force to unify the emperor. Now I think there's a lot of truth to that and you can see that in the history. Uh, because the Gnostics had more independent thought that did not require mediators in the form of priests and bishops, the political unification of the rulers was threatened and therefore the Gnostics had to be removed. Now, I'm not sure I agree with that. But what is intriguing to find out is that the Catholic Church may have disagreed bitterly with the Gnostics and it's true that at the Council of Nicaea 
they did reject Gnosticism, even though the council was called to refute Arianism, Gnosticism wasn't the main issue. Anyway, there was plenty of evidence that the ideas of the Gnostics were incorporated in the Catholic Church almost from the beginning, and we will go ahead now to show and demonstrate that. <laughs> 